Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to talk about recent developments in quantum computing. Now, I want to stress from the start, this is not going to be a technical video, it's more of a practical overview of where quantum computing is heading, but that said I think we should start out with a two-minute summary of what quantum computing is all about. Conventional or classical computers are built from transistors that are turned on or off to represent a value of either 1 or 0. In turn, this allows classical computers to store and process data using binary digits or bits. In contrast, quantum computers process information using quantum bits or qubits that can be represented by subatomic particles or superconducting electrical circuits. Due to the strange laws of quantum mechanics, qubits can exist in more than one state or superposition at exactly the same point in time. This allows a qubit to assume a value of 1 or 0 or both of these numbers simultaneously. In turn, this enables a quantum computer to process a far higher number of data possibilities than a classical computer. It also means that every qubit added to a quantum computer increases its power exponentially. In addition to assuming superpositions, qubits can become entangled. Entanglement is another quantum mechanical property and means that the state of one qubit can depend on the state of another. This is useful and powerful as it means that observing one qubit can reveal the state of its unobserved pair. Creating and manipulating qubits is very hard indeed. Many existing quantum processors exploit the quantum phenomena that occur in superconducting materials and hence need to be cooled to almost absolute zero. Significant shielding against background noise is also required and even then performing computation using qubits requires significant error correction. Indeed, a grand challenge in quantum computing is the creation of a truly fault-tolerant machine. So, what's been going on in the world of quantum computing in the past 12 months? Well, there's been lots of technical things going on, but I think from our point of view here, there are three things we should really focus on. Firstly, as we're about to see, many of the big quantum computing pioneers have announced new hardware and new online resources. Secondly, as we're also about to see, an increasing number of companies are starting to investigate the practical business application of the technology. And finally, there's been a lot of discussion of quantum supremacy, or in other words, the creation of a quantum computer that can outperform a classical computer. So, let's now go and look in more depth at each of these three things. Companies developing quantum computers include IBM, Alibaba, Microsoft, Google, Intel, D-Wave Systems, Quantum Circuits, INQ and Regetti. Many of these firms work in conjunction with major university research teams and all continue to accrue significant progress. For example, in November 2017, IBM reported that it was making 20 qubit quantum computers available to client users of its cloud-based service IBM Q. In parallel, it also announced the construction of a prototype 50 qubit quantum processor. Given that IBM's most powerful previous generation model was 20 qubits, this represented a very major upgrade. In its press release, IBM also reported the expansion of Qiskit. This is an open source quantum computing framework for leveraging today's quantum processors and conducting research and is publicly accessible. IBM also offers free cloud access to 5 and 16 qubit quantum computers via a website called the IBM Q Experience. Another large company now providing online access to quantum hardware is Alibaba. Specifically, in March 2018, the Chinese e-business giant launched its superconducting quantum computing cloud to provide access to an 11 qubit quantum computer. This was developed with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and like the IBM Q experience, allows users to run quantum programs and download the results. Others offering online access to quantum computing resources include Microsoft and Rigetti. 
In December 2017, the former released a preview of its quantum computing development kit. This is free to download and includes a programming language called QHash and a quantum computing simulator. The kit was most recently updated in June 2018 and allows anybody to learn about and practice quantum computing. Or alternatively, over on the website of quantum computing startup Rigetti, you can obtain access to a quantum developer environment called Forest. Another tech giant working on quantum computing hardware is Google. Not least, in March 2018, the company outgunned IBM when it announced a new 72-qubit quantum processor called Bristlecone. This may potentially be used to achieve quantum supremacy, as I'll discuss later in the video. Also pushing forward the quantum computing frontier is Intel, which in November 2017 announced the delivery of a 17-qubit test chip to its Dutch research partner, QTEC. Then, in January 2018 at CES, Intel further announced the delivery of a 49-qubit test quantum processor called Tangle Lake. Not one to rest on its laurels, in June 2018, Intel then reported that it was testing a 26-qubit quantum chip based on a technology called Spin Qubit. This was potentially a very significant milestone, as Intel's Spin Qubit processors are manufactured using its traditional silicon fabrication methods. The qubits on Intel's Spin Qubit wafers are also only 50 nanometers across, or 1 1500th the width of a human hair. So, in time, Intel could be manufacturing tiny quantum processors containing thousands or millions of qubits. Unlike conventional microprocessors, these would still need to be supercooled to almost absolute zero. But their potential is still truly breathtaking. Quantum computers are not intended to replace traditional computers, and therefore lots of people keep asking me what will quantum computers actually be used for? Now, the general answer to that is that quantum computers will find initial application in areas such as molecular and material modeling, aeronautical simulation, logistics optimization, financial modeling, cryptography, and pattern matching activities such as deep learning artificial intelligence. The simulation of molecular and other systems is a particularly strong candidate for quantum computing, as the systems to be simulated are themselves quantum in nature. Already, some businesses are investigating the commercial potential. To help facilitate such research, IBM also runs a community called the IBM Q Network. And to give you an idea of just what is being worked on and by whom, some examples are as follows. Daimler is working with both IBM and Google to investigate how quantum computers may be used in logistics to do things like optimising the delivery routes of vehicles or the flow of parts through factories. The company is also researching how quantum computers could be used to simulate chemical structures and reactions inside batteries and so assist in the improvement of electric vehicles. Also in the automotive sector, Volkswagen is working with both Google and D-Wave systems to see how quantum computers may assist in traffic flow optimization. Over in the financial sector, JP Morgan is working with IBM to explore how quantum computers may assist with trading strategies, portfolio optimization, asset pricing, and risk analysis. Barclays is similarly working within the IBM Q network to see if quantum computers could be used to optimize the settlement of large batches of financial transactions. In aerospace, Lockheed Martin was the first purchaser of a quantum computer from D-Wave Systems and hopes to use the technology for purposes such as traffic management and system verification. Meanwhile, Accenture Labs Biogen and OneQubit are researching how drug discovery could be accelerated by using quantum computing to make molecular comparisons. Even if quantum computers can perform useful tasks, there'll be little point in building them if they can't do those tasks better than a traditional computer. And this brings us to the subject of quantum supremacy, a term first coined in 2012 in this paper by John Preskill. And as he wrote in this paper, in the era of quantum supremacy, we will be able to perform tasks with controlled quantum systems going beyond what can be achieved with ordinary digital computers. 
Until very recently, it was thought that 49 or 50 qubits would be sufficient to achieve quantum supremacy. However, in October 2017, IBM demonstrated that it was possible to simulate a 49 qubit quantum computer using traditional hardware. And so the 49 qubit machine from Intel and the 50 qubit machine from IBM are unlikely to be found to be quantum supreme. And even the 72 qubit machine from Google may not be up to the challenge because in May 2018, this paper was published by researchers at Alibaba that showed that that type of hardware can still be simulated using traditional computers. Now, more broadly, the more people think about quantum supremacy, the more complex and the more controversial the idea becomes. For a start, it's a moving target as traditional computers continue to get more powerful. Also, not all qubits are created equal, so it's difficult to determine a ballpark number required. Already, D-Wave systems have built a 2000 qubit adiabatic quantum computer based on a technology called quantum annealing. However, as I discussed in my last quantum computing video, this is not necessarily more powerful than Intel, IBM or Google hardware with far fewer qubits. Error correction is also a major problem. So we may need a system with tens of thousands of qubits to deliver a few hundred that are fault tolerant and which can outperform any classical computer on the planet. Finally, it's increasingly accepted that even when quantum supremacy occurs, this does not mean that quantum computers will be ready to perform useful work. Inside the quantum computing community, the idea of quantum supremacy is therefore starting to be downplayed. Now, absolutely, I suspect that in the next few years, maybe in the next five years, some company will claim the milestone of having achieved quantum supremacy. But I also suspect that that announcement will be of far more interest to investors and journalists than it will be to computer scientists and engineers in the quantum computing community. Today, there is clearly increasing confidence that at some point quantum computing will become a viable commercial reality. Indeed, if we look at IBM's quantum computing homepage, we learn that today quantum computing is a researcher's playground, but in five years it will be mainstream. Now, such a five-year prediction may well be optimistic, and Intel, for example, thinks it will take more like 10 years for quantum computing to arrive. But that said, I think regardless of where you look now, there does seem to be a very strong view, a strong confidence emerging that by the late 2020s, by 2030s, we will have some form of commercial quantum computing. And those early commercial quantum computing services will be being used for things like designing and testing new materials, designing and testing new medicines, for optimizing our use of energy and other resources, optimizing transportation, and for creating more and more powerful forms of artificial intelligence. This said, I strongly suspect that the real killer applications of quantum computing won't actually arrive, they won't be discovered until the first generation of the machines have been available for some time and a new generation of hackers and programmers have had time to play with them. So there we are, my review of the last 12 months in quantum computing. If you want to learn more, I have left some links down in the video description, but there is limited space down there, and so I've left even more links and a lot more information on the quantum computing page, which you can find on explainingcomputers.com. Also, if you're interested in the future of computing more generally, quantum and other things, you might want to look at my latest book, Digital Genesis, The Future of Computing, Robots and AI. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.